Each night of the festival, people who are healed, they would come up to the stage and they testify. And after that, we like to collect their name and their phone number and their address so that we can go and visit them and interview them the next day and go and actually find them right in their homes and listen to their stories. Normally, if we can't find people or we're having a harder time finding people, we have their cell phone number, so we give them a call. And they sort of give us a little bit more instruction and or if we're really close to them, they're, they're waving their hands or tracking us down somehow to give us some sort of signal where they are. But with Iriana, we were just feet away from her. She wasn't giving us any signal at all. It was just really difficult to find her. At that point, we realized something was maybe a little bit wrong. Maybe she was scared of us. There's something different about her. We could tell before we even met her. After we had located her by calling her on the cell phone, I knew right away something was different. Something wasn't right about our visit with her. I got out of the car, you know, and we, we walked into this small alleyway where her house was. And, uh, and I just greeted her and I told her the reason why we came, you know, that we were a team coming from the festival and that we just wanted to talk with her and to visit with her and, and to have her share about what had happened the night before the festival. I actually remember sitting in the vehicle and seeing this all take place. The moment Susan introduces herself, uh, lets her know why we're there, Iriana just starts hugging her and a huge smile comes on her face and her countenance had completely changed. We found out in talking with Yuridiana that the reason that she was scared uh, when we were trying to locate her is she thought we were coming for payment because she was healed the night before. We knew that it was free, but we thought maybe that people would try to approach us afterwards and ask for money. That's why she was afraid of us coming. <laughs> but you didn't have to pay anything. <laughs> And we later found out too that she didn't have money and she was afraid that she wasn't going to be able to pay us. When all of us got out of the vehicle, we didn't have time to set up for a formal interview. Iriana was so happy that we had come to visit with her that she just started telling us the story. When I was a baby, I fell from my bed and from that point on, I couldn't hear from my ear at all. When I was in school, I was so ashamed because people called me the deaf girl and I grew to hate it. I hated being called deaf and people talking about me like that. And no matter what she had done through her childhood or through her adult life, no matter what medicine she had taken, she had stayed deaf. And when we met her, she was 22 years old, which means that she had been deaf for 22 years. In any city that we have a gospel festival in, there's posters, there's billboards, advertising that Peter Youngren is coming, that it's open to everybody, that it's free, bring the sick, bring the blind, bring the deaf. I decided to come to the festival because of my husband. He was at work and was talking to some of his friends about the festival. He asked them, even though my wife and I are Muslims, can we still go? My wife can't hear me very well when I talk, and it's very difficult to communicate with her. Can I bring her? And his friends from work said, yes, the festival is open for everyone. So he came home to me that night and he said, let's go. Even though it's raining, we have to go to the festival. I borrowed 10,000 rupiah for the taxi, so let's go. Iriana and her husband had spent so much of their money in medication, trying to find a cure, trying to help her. And so she shared with us that they had no money to get to the festival, to even take the transportation to get there. So they had gone and borrowed 10,000 rupiah from a friend. And I know that sounds like a lot of money, but actually 10,000 rupiah is about one dollar. And so they had gone and borrowed this dollar so that they could take the bus, so that they could get to the festival. It was, it was really amazing. When we got to the festival, my husband said to me, whatever that speaker says, you need to listen to him. You need to believe what Dr. Peter Youngren is saying. And so I sat and listened and accepted it all into my heart. Tell the people what Jesus has done for you. At first, I felt my whole body was shaking and I couldn't stop it. And then when I went on stage to testify, I could feel sounds starting to come into my ear. It felt like it was shooting in a little bit at a time into my ear. So for 22 years, this ear was dead. Cover up your left ear. Put your finger very tight. Can you hear my voice? Say, Amen. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, now this year was dead completely for 22 years. Now I'm really going to whisper behind her. That's going to happen for the biscuit. Okay. Tanika. Tanika. Hallelujah. Oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. When doing these interviews, uh, we often meet many people who have never heard of Jesus before, who have just heard of him at the festival. That was the first time that I had heard about Jesus, but I knew that only God can heal people and that man can't do that. So it was really quite amazing that she had come to the festival for just one night and had heard about Jesus and received his healing into her life. You know, if it hadn't been for the Gospel Festival in Meroki, we don't know if Iriana would have ever heard about Jesus. Perhaps she would have just continued living her life, being deaf in her right ear. But because we had partners that were willing to support Peter Youngren to go to Meroke, Indonesia, Iriana heard about Jesus, she believed in Jesus, and as a result, healing came into her ear, and now she's able to hear freely. Now, she wants to go back home to tell her Muslim family what had happened. She wanted to go home and share about how Jesus had touched her and healed her. So this was really amazing to me that not only was she touched and her and her husband there, but that they would actually take the news of Jesus to another island. It didn't just stay in the festival or in the city where the festival was done, but it was going to actually spread to a whole different island to a whole other community over there about the miracle that she had received. I can't believe it. It's like I can't even realize that this has even happened to me, that I can hear again. To be honest with you, this was probably one of the most heart-ripping stories that I've been a part of or I've heard. You know, just here I am standing in the back alley, listening to Susan interpreting the story, and I have tears running down my face because I'm so touched by how genuine this girl is. Listening to how poor her and her husband are, how they have no money, how they spent all their money on medication. They don't even have a dollar to come to the festival. They have to borrow a dollar to get there. And when she comes, she listens, she believes, and she's healed. And it just, it's such an incredible story. I remember I was translating from Indonesian to English, and sometimes it would, it would be difficult for me to translate what she was saying because I was so caught up in her story. And sometimes I would even want to start crying with her. We've touched this woman's life in a huge way, and she will never be the same again. And it's just, to me, words can't truly really explain how touched I was by this story. One family looking for answers. One night. A chance to hear about Jesus. One dollar to get to the festival. One miracle. She believed in Jesus. One Jesus. For everyone. One partner. You can make a difference.